Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I decided to bring this new series, this new course that I'm bringing to the channel where I'm going to try to teach you guys everything I believe you have to know um, in order to say that you've learned and understand GraphQL. So I'm going to go from the beginning and I decided to divide the series in a way such that um, it's not going to be very long episodes. Um, you can watch it whenever you want. And I'm going to have a very established chronological order where I start going over some of the basics um, about the language and about what exactly is GraphQL and all that kind of stuff. And then I transition more into um, actually building the stuff. And finally, at the end, uh, I really hope you guys will have a really good understanding of GraphQL and just understand when you should use it and why it is important and used by many large companies. So in this first episode, um, I'm just going to go over some of the basics and I talk a little bit about GraphQL as a whole and uh, also lay out exactly what will be the structure of the, pro of the, the course. So initially, as you can see, um, this will be the kind of the, the course structure. Um, in this video, I'm going to be talking about what is GraphQL and some of the differences between GraphQL and creating a normal REST API. Um, I'm also going to talk about other stuff like um, how to use a GraphQL API, and I'm going to show you guys a clear example on, on how to do that, which I hope will teach you guys um, at least some of the, the basics just to get used to the language we use with GraphQL, um, understand where it comes from, and start understanding the very clear differences between fetching data coming from a, a REST API or from a GraphQL API. And by the way, this structure isn't divided by videos. Um, the amount of videos will be uh, chosen later on. However, I'll try to post um, at least four times a week uh, for this series um, so that those who are watching as I'm posting don't have to wait um, a long time to get the next episode. The, the episodes will be pretty short, as I mentioned, uh, just because I don't want to bore anyone out. And I know that if I make very long episodes, people might decide not to watch it because they don't want to commit to it. So if I make it short and, and simple, I really hope you guys will be able to stay focused and get as much value as possible from each episode. So I also want to talk about um, how to actually create a GraphQL API. And for that, I'm going to be using Node.js, um, JavaScript, and um, Apollo server, which is the library, the, the wrapper around uh, our, our, our API for GraphQL, to serve GraphQL in our application. And when we start building that, um, we, I'm going to teach you guys a lot about the actual GraphQL language. So like, um, what are types, um, queries, mutations, what are scalars, um, what are enums, unions, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to try to really focus on the GraphQL query language because I feel like it is something that is lacking a lot in, in other tutorial series around GraphQL and YouTube. Um, and since obviously I, I'm not, I'm not including paid courses. Um, I want to compare this course to other courses who are, which are also free. So um, I feel like this kind of information is lacking. So I really want to go over that because it becomes confusing if you don't really understand the basics of the GraphQL language. Um, and finally, at the end of the series, we're going to um, we're going to fetch the data from the API we created um, in React. And uh, with that, in, to do that, we're going to be using a very very famous library called Apollo Client which um, is used by many, many large companies. And it is probably the most famous uh, GraphQL library in, in React. And um, with that, I'm going to teach everything related to Apollo Client because it is another huge topic that I feel like it, it isn't explained enough. I'm going to be talking about um, all the different hooks that you, you that comes with the library, um, all of the different aspects of your on how to fetch your data. I'm going to talk about caching, all that kind of stuff. So it is interesting. I'm really excited for this series. And I really hope you guys stick with me throughout this whole series. If you want to jump a couple episodes, you can do that too. You can jump to the episode where I talk about um, how to create the API and how to create the Node.js application. Or if you're just interested in learning um, about um, how to incorporate an API into React, you can just jump to the episode where I do that as well. Um, so that's why I want to keep this series very simple and well structured so that anyone can come um, and watch the episodes whenever they want to refresh their, their, their skills or just want to learn something that they haven't learned in the past. So with that in mind, let's start talking about um, the important stuff. Um, so what exactly is GraphQL? Well, as uh, if you searched that that question on Google before, you've probably seen a very broad explanation, probably saying something like that GraphQL is a query language. And what exactly does it mean um, for GraphQL to be a query language? Well, 
many of you guys might, might have heard in the past that SQL is a query language, right? It, it is a query language. And that might imply and, and create this false notion that a GraphQL is something related to a database or a GraphQL is a database. But that's, that's not true at all. Um, query languages are not specific to databases. Um, query languages are, are used or, or is a programming language used to get data. May it be from a database or in GraphQL, uh, it will be from an API. So GraphQL exists as a technically a layer in between your front end and your back end. And the client, which is the front end, will use this query language to request data from the API. And GraphQL will take into that, take that thing into consideration and will decide what to return or what to do based on that. So differently from SQL or other database languages, um, GraphQL exists in between the, the front end and the, and the back end. Um, and usually those, those query languages related to database exist in between the back end and the database. So that is a distinction that I really want to make because I hate going online and seeing someone asking, um, which database do you use? Do you use GraphQL? And I don't know why I've seen that in the past. And the reason why I hate that is because it is something that I used to think. Uh, I used to see the, 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 the letters QL at the end and think it was, some type of SQL database. So I really want to show you guys that it isn't. And if you keep that in mind that um, GraphQL queries an API and not a database, um, you might wonder, okay, but what what aspects of like, how does this differ from a normal request that you make to a REST API? Well, there's a, a, an interesting distinction that you need to, to make, which is um, in GraphQL, there is two types of requests, uh, technically, there is a query and the mutation. They're not called requests, they're actually called um, types um, that exist inside of GraphQL. Um, but every GraphQL application will exist, will have these two types, a query and a mutation. And I want you guys to think of it this way. Inside of a query will exist all of the data that you, you might want to request. So if you're in the front end and you want to make a request for some sort of data, um, you're going to make a query. And all of that, that the logic will exist inside of the queries. So technically, we attribute that um, if we're talking about, for example, the HTTP methods that you're, you're probably used to, um, the, the get method will be specifically connected to queries in GraphQL. So whenever you hear about a query in GraphQL, think of a get request because you're getting some data, you're querying some data uh, that you want to receive in your front end. Now, a mutation is a bit different and a bit weird if you're not familiar with it. Just think about the notion that I mentioned that um, GraphQL is handling data. So mutations um, incorporates everything related to mutating the data, to, to changing the data. So for that reason, um, it is the same thing as a put request, a delete request, and a post request. Um, because everything, like if you want to update data in your, in your API, you call a mutation. If you want to delete data in your API, you call a mutation. If you want to create data in your API, you call a mutation. But if you want to get data from your API, you call a query. This is the distinction. With GraphQL, you don't need to specify what kind of uh, HTTP request you're making in your front end. You just specify if you're trying to make a query or a mutation and GraphQL will know how to handle that. And that's one, one of the things that I really like about it because it abstracts all of this uh, no, notion over here, but it, it, does, it does actually have this um, methods um, and GraphQL on its core is actually either making a get request or a post request. However, um, you really don't need to know that um, just know that you won't have to worry about what kind of requests and methods you're using when you're working with GraphQL. And one thing that I really, really wanted to talk about because it is something that I used to be very confused on is, um, as I mentioned, GraphQL can exist um, as a layer in between your front end and your back end. So this over here would be the front end. This would be the API, your, your back end, which um, let's imagine it is actually a REST API. It has a bunch of endpoints that you can make requests, right? Somewhere here would be the database and the API communicates with the database to, to, I don't know, put data inside of there or retrieve data, do whatever it wants with it. What happens is GraphQL can exist in two ways um, inside of a, a normal application that someone is developing. It can either be a completely different separate service from your backend and uh, your frontend only communicates with GraphQL, which then makes a request to your backend service or it can exist as your backend service. And I know that's kind of confusing, but just know that the, the front end, if you're using GraphQL, will never make a request to an endpoint in the backend. It will never do that because 
the GraphQL layer exists in between them. So it will always be communicating with the GraphQL. And depending on how you want to approach your project, you can either make the GraphQL uh, layer be your backend, or you can just separate them like this. And that's what happens, I believe, with many big companies. If they want to um, scale their development services, they can just separate them. But um, you'll see many tutorials online um, creating an express API which already incorporates GraphQL. And that's what we're going to be doing in this tutorial series for simplicity reasons. Um, but I really hope that at the end as well, I will be able to show you guys um, a little bit of this separation. Uh, but that, that will be something that I will talk right at the end so that you guys can also start understanding how a project can be structured so that it, it, it is actually separating the backend from the GraphQL layer. And immediately you can realize that um, it is a bit different, right? It's a, it's a bit weird. It is completely different from what people are usually used to with REST because REST is just, uh, you make a, a fetch, you fetch a request um, to your, your API um, and you request an endpoint, you specify the method and the API just um, recognizes that request and returns data or uh, changes the data or does something with it. And now when I introduce GraphQL, I'm talking about this weird thing, which is a layer that exists in between them. So I understand it, it might seem a bit confusing in the beginning, but believe me, it gets a lot better. And I want to talk a little bit about this specifically. What exactly are the differences between a GraphQL API and a REST API? Well, the first difference is that there's only one endpoint. And that, that was something that I was really confused in the beginning. Because think about it that way. You're used to creating th like hundreds of endpoints, depending on what you want to do inside of your front end. Um, with GraphQL, that's that's fixed and that's that's amazing. You don't need to the, the the front end developers don't need to memorize all the endpoints. They don't need to know what endpoint um, is be. I need to make a request to. Um, all of the requests will be made to a single endpoint called slash GraphQL. So imagine you have an application which um, require like it needs data from a user. Um, it needs data from the followers um, and from posts or something like that, like a social media. Um, normally, if you're using REST, you would probably have um, some routes and some endpoints with this structure. But with GraphQL, all of them will be made to the single endpoint, which is the slash GraphQL endpoint. And another point that is really interesting is overfetching and underfetching. And what I mean by that is imagine that you have um, this beautiful profile page design that I made over here. I know it looks ugly, but just imagine it as a website. And you have here a profile page with uh, like your the user, the, like the profile pic for the user who is logged in. And they have like a feed with all the posts that they've made. And imagine it's something like this. And in the same web page, you also have to know information about like um, the followers, right? So the people who follow this user. So you need their pictures and you need their names and that kind of stuff. So you have um, a bunch of data that you need to manage and you need to access in the front end. So in order to make that work, you can do it in either, like if you're using REST, you can either do it in two ways and both ways have issues to it. So one way, the problem is that you're gonna find yourself over fetching data, which is the case I have over here. You can create one endpoint and you can call it something like slash user info or you slash user profile, something like that. And it returns literally everything. It returns a JSON with the user ID, their email, their name, their picture, a list of followers. And for each follower, it returns their name, their picture, their ID, that kind of stuff. Um, and then for the posts, they, they probably exist in a different table as well. So you also need to return the list of all the posts. And this is kind of bad because um, imagine you want to fetch just the followers. Uh, but then just to fetch, just to fetch the followers, you also need to get the information about the posts and the information about the user in himself, which doesn't really make sense because you're, you're fetching more data than what you're asking for. So with rest, what people usually do is they separate stuff into different endpoints. So if I only want to get info about the followers, I'll create a followers and endpoint and I'll just send the data for the followers uh, through that endpoint. And it would look something like this. Um, I know some of the pictures might have bad quality, but um, you can see like for the followers, you're only gaining this kind of information. For the post, you're only getting the post information. And for the user, you're only getting the user information. However, this is kind of under fetching, right? Because when you have a situation like the page that I showed previously, you, you, you really don't want to make three API calls just to get that data. 
Each request is underfetching the information that it needs for the client, for the front end. So the problem is with the REST architecture, we're, we're, we're letting the back end determine what kind of, uh, of data the front end wants, which doesn't really make sense. The front end should tell the back end exactly what it wants and the back end should just serve that data and give it back to the front end. So GraphQL kind of turns that around. It allows the front end to specify exactly what they want and GraphQL as, as the language, as the, the layer, will allow us to do it that way and will basically resolve everything and fix everything for us so that you're never overfetching or underfetching data. With GraphQL, you really don't, you, like you specify what you want. So I can have all of this data over here, but in the front end, I can just specify that I only want the name and GraphQL will only return the name. And you might think, okay, but but still, the backend will have access to all of this. Isn't that bad? Well, not technically. The the, the One of the most costly things in a, in a website is fetching the data and downloading the data in the front end. So it's a lot better to just download uh, a JSON with this field than downloading all of this at once. So that's kind of what GraphQL does. And if it's confusing right now, don't worry, we'll definitely see how that works and we'll use that throughout the series. And that's basically it for the first episode. Um, I, I'm aware that some of the stuff that I talked about might not be very clear yet, but um, that's completely fine. Um, I, I just want to let you guys know that if you stick with the series, uh, you'll definitely get it after a while because we're going to be uh, providing more hands-on examples. Next episode, we're already going to be working with the GraphQL API and you guys will be able to see exactly how it works and, and how easy it is to fetch data. So I'm really excited for the next episodes. Remember that I'm going to be posting them in sequence so you won't have to wait. And, and yeah, I'm really, really excited for this series. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and comment what you want to see next. Subscribe because I'm posting um, hopefully four times a week and I would massively appreciate if you guys could help support the channel. And yeah, that's basically it. I really hope you guys enjoyed it and I see you guys next time.